Christian character. Very important. The Lord wants us to be like him. We're supposed to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all these things we're presenting for weeks and weeks, and we're about done. We'll just have a couple more. But uh, all these things we are presenting are things that Jesus Christ himself practiced on this earth. And thus he's our example as his people to follow his steps. So all these are important. I hope you're listening. I hope that you're seeing what the scriptures say, evaluating yourself as I give you a personal evaluation each week and uh, see where you stand on these Christian character traits that God wants to see in our life. Here's an important one tonight. And I don't know if the video is not going to work. All right. I had my computer back there, and Kent says that, unfortunately, it's updating everything, and he can't get into it, and it won't come on. So I am so sorry. I'll try to mention these things if you want to write them down. Our topic tonight in the Bible is called temperance. We would also call it self-control. And for that particular Key verse, let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Now, how would you define self-control? For us as Christians, I believe we would define it this way. It would be the habit. And have you noticed me saying this about all the character traits, the habit? You've got to get in the habit of practicing these things. That's how you're going to be blessed of the Lord. It would be the habit of being able to control or restrain your body, your thoughts, and your emotions. The absolute habit of being able to control, restrain your body, your thoughts, and your emotions. All of that takes self-control. Now, thankfully, we do not have to do this in our own power. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit lives within us. And when you go to Galatians chapter 5, it's all about this need of self-control to overcome fleshly things and have the Spirit of God controlling your heart. Look at verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There it is. We've got to walk in the Spirit, live in His strength and power day by day, ask Him for help each day, and we can then walk the right Christian life and overcome these things that lack self-control. There's a list of them here, the, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. It's not a complete list there. You can find more things throughout the New Testament. But such like, things like that, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things, practice such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These are things lost people do. So we as Christians need to get them out of our life. We've got to walk in the Spirit for that to happen. What do we have to do further? We'll look at verses 22 to 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Here's our word, temperance, which means self-control. Against such there is no law. Now here's a key in verse 24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. We've got to say, Holy Spirit, help me to be done with all the wrong things. Help me to do the right things. Help me to have self-control over my body, my thoughts, and my emotions. Our example is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let's just go to one book and notice some examples of the great self-control of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke. Go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 4. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, we're introduced at the beginning of this chapter to what's called the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the devil comes to him. And in the first temptation, he says in verse 3, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Now remember, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Don't you think he'd be a little bit hungry? Here's a bodily function. Nothing wrong with it. Except Jesus was in the midst of a special fast beginning his earthly public ministry and he was not to eat. So what did it take on his part to not want to turn those stones into bread and eat? self control and with that self-control he gives the devil a verse verse 4 it is written that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God wow what control you know he could have said devil be cast into hell this minute you know God could cast the devil in the hell any minute God has a program and a plan he's carrying out on this earth, so it's not time for that yet. It's coming in the future. We read it in Revelation. It's coming. Hallelujah. But right now, he held his control and simply overcame him with Scripture. The devil tempts him again, of course, in verse number 7. Worship me, and I'll give you all power over this earth. Was that an empty thing? No. The devil had gotten power over this earth because of man's sin. So he had control. He said, I'll give it up to you if you'll just worship me. Well, who's that going to mean is going to be in control if Jesus worshiped the devil? Even though he had control of the world. It would be the devil. He held self-control again with the devil and quoted him another scripture. Verse 8, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written... Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I know I'm in the flesh, and I know that I'm bowing before God the Father, but he's the one I'm worshiping, not you. Self-control. He does it again, of course, in verse number 11. There, of course, we find that the devil says, cast yourself off the pinnacle of the temple and, you know, the angels will grab a hold of you and it'll be a miracle, it'll shock people. Uh, it'll be a great thing for you to do that. Notice what Jesus said again. He held self-control. He's not going to do what the devil said. It's, he, he, it is said, written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What an example of self-control and dealing with the devil with Scripture. Same thing we need to learn. When the devil tempts us, what's going to keep you from sinning and doing what's wrong? The Scriptures. Have the scriptures in your heart and mind when the old devil comes with that. That's why we're trying to memorize scriptures week by week. I'm trying to help you learn them. And so, you know, we have them there. And when the devil comes, boy, that scripture you learn will pop in your mind. You'll be able to defeat him with that. See, if you submit to God and resist the devil, he flees from you. You do not have to give in to the devil. God's more powerful. And you, with the Holy Spirit in you, giving scripture, the devil can't stand it. You can overcome him. Jesus had great self-control. Now, we find more self-control right here in chapter number 4 as well because you'll notice, beginning in verse 16, he goes to his hometown, Nazareth. And in his hometown, Nazareth, these people would not accept him. He said in verse 24, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. They listen to Jesus but say, you're Joseph's son. We can't believe you're the Messiah. We can't listen to you. You're just Joseph's son. They couldn't get over a simple carpenter life that he was raised. Can't believe he would possibly be the Messiah. So don't listen to him. And in verse number 29, they even rise up, thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of a hill, and they were going to throw Jesus over the hill. Now he could have at that moment just called one archangel. Michael to come down and say, that's it, folk. Boom. Wiping them all out. He could have just spoken a word. 
and wiped them all out. But Jesus didn't do that. He absolutely kept his control and slipped out of the midst of them and was gone. Self-control. We see it again in chapter number 9. Now this is with his disciples here. In verse number 51, we find that the Lord Jesus went through, down through verse number 56, a town of the Samaritans. And they wouldn't receive him because they heard he's going to Jerusalem and he's a Jew and the Samaritans and Jews did not get along. And his disciples are with Jesus who are Jews. They had hatred in their hearts yet for the Samaritans too. So when the Samaritans wouldn't let him pass through their town, look what the disciples said in verse number 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias or Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. The first time Jesus came, he came to save men. When he comes back to this earth the second time, he's coming to judge them. So the first time he didn't, though, he came to present salvation. So he kept self-control. He taught his disciples self-control. Though people don't treat you right, you don't treat them bad because of that. Accept what they're doing and you just go on and serve me. So what self-control exhibits here? One other place in Luke 23, 34, you don't have to turn there, but when he's on the cross and they're crucifying him, doing terrible things to Jesus, I mentioned this Sunday morning, what did he pray on the cross? What did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What self-control. What self-control. Somebody just told me recently, I won't be able to forgive this person for what they've done. I won't be able to. I said, well... With God's help, you certainly can, and we should. But Jesus forgave the whole world. Isn't that something? What self-control? And we need to have that same self-control. All right, let's pinpoint a little bit further here tonight. We said you need self-control over your body. You need self-control over your thoughts. You need self-control over your emotions. What are some of the bodily appetites that we have to overcome? Well, one right off the bat would be eating. Can we overeat? Is that wrong? Suppose you had two pieces of cake and there's just one left. And you said, man, somebody's got to finish that off. I know I'm full, but I'm going to do it. And stuff yourself. Is that exercising self-control? you got to keep your body under subjection. Even in eating. It's possible. You know, sometimes people get nervous in a service if they're here past 12 p.m. It's eating time. My body needs to eat. i got to get out of this place. And some people leave. What's controlling them? Their bodily appetite. Couldn't we be just a few minutes like Jesus 40 days and do without food and stay a little longer if a preacher goes overtime? Who in the world says we got to be out of this place at 12 noon? Your bodily lack of self-control tells you that. So, folk, there's a lot of ways you can apply this when it comes to your body. Here's another thing, perhaps. Laziness. Oh, you know, you need to get up at a certain time. If you don't, you won't have time to have your devotions and get everything in order before you go to work. However, the bed feels so good. It's cold outside. Just five more minutes. Just 10 more minutes. Just 15. And all of a sudden, you got to jump, jump out of bed and get rushing around. Don't have time for devotions. Don't have time to take it easy. You got to zoom, zoom, zoom to get to work. What's controlling you? Your body rather than self control. We've got to have self control and discipline ourselves and say, hey, here's the time to get up. Get up at that time. Now, I'm used to getting up at a certain time every morning. And guess what? I wake up that time even on Saturday if my wife wants me to sleep in a little while. Just wake up. 
I haven't used an alarm clock in years. I just wake up and get up. Don't stay there. Get up. Go. And you got plenty of time. Plenty of time to wake up. Plenty of time to do things. Discipline. Self-control. It's so important in our lives. Well, there's also, you know, well, <laughs> nobody's around. I'll just take 10 minute more break at work. Is that keeping your body under subjection? Hmm. Interesting. Let's move on real fast. I'll go on to this matter of your thought life. We have to watch what we think. By the way, I didn't give you the verse for keeping your body under subjection. 1 Corinthians 9.27. The Apostle Paul said this. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself will be a castaway. I've got to have self-control or I'm going to be a castaway in my Christian life. So apply that to our bodily desires. Watch it. There's your thoughts. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10, 5 right quick and notice a verse about controlling our thought life, which is absolutely so important too. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse 5. You have to bear with me. I mentioned about a few weeks ago I'm breaking in a new Bible and the pages don't turn. <laughs> I don't like to break in new Bibles. I like to keep my old ones going, but they finally fall apart. So I have to. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity or bringing under control every thought to the obedience of Christ. Our thinking needs to be kept under self-control. In what way? Well, Philippians 4, 8 tells us things to think about. I won't read that verse for now, but things that are pure and just, of good report and so on, that's the kind of things we need to think on. We have to watch out for the others. You know, watch what you see on TV. There's bad things on TV. A Christian ought not to look at it. It's going to get into your heart and mind and lodge there. The more bad things you see, the more likely you're going to think that way or even wind up doing those things. Keep your mind clean. There's a lot on there that we don't need to see. Also, watch out for bad thoughts about people. Oh, that person over there, I saw the look on their face. I just know. They're planning something not good for me. Hmm. Or maybe in your thought life there, you happen to think, huh, I can't stand that person. I wonder what I could do to get even with them. Hmm. <laughs> People are like that, you know. People are like that. We got to watch our thought life. What do we got to do with our thought? Put the word of God in there. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approved unto God. If you're going to control your thoughts, you've got to put right things in there. So get the word of God in there to be approved by God. You can't be approved by God if you don't study his word. That's what that verse means. So we need to get there and put the right things in our thought life. Now also, there's the emotions that have to be kept under control. Our emotions. Proverbs 25, 28 would be a key verse on this particular subject. In Proverbs 25, 28, it says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down and without walls. And in this day and time, if your city's broken down without walls, you're going to be conquered and not stay there. You're going to lose your city. So what he's saying is you don't control your spirit, your emotions, you're going to be conquered by the enemy. you got to get control of what? Well, first of all, there would be our temper. Our temper is part of our emotions. Perhaps somebody upsets us a big de a deal and we don't hit them, but we go and kick the wall. Not too smart. You might break your toe. But some people pick something up and have to throw it whenever they uh, get mad and upset. 
You know, we got to learn to get that temper under control. It's got to be controlled. Or perhaps there's road rage. <laughs> you see it all the time. Somebody go along too slow. And people come up behind them, try to push them over. Now, we have a difficult time on our street. Bless their hearts, there's this elderly couple. I don't know how old they are. They're old. They get in this great big old, and I mean old, it looks like it's ready to turn over its last leaf any moment, this old Lincoln Continental car. And they pull out in the street, and it's a big one because it's an old one. And they go 15 to 20 miles an hour. If you get behind them out in the country going through Stone Creek, just mark it down. It's going to take you twice as long to get home. No way to get It's frustrating. It's frustrating. And I've seen people at times, you know, try to get around them. I saw one man one day when they were, you know, over far enough that got around them, sped, just went. I don't know how fast he was going. Just mad as can be that they held him up, you know. Road rage. Lack of self-control even in that. And we could give a lot of examples of losing our temper, but definitely that's something that has to be under control. Also, there is our tongue. James 3 is a whole chapter about our tongue and controlling it. The Bible says our tongue can no man control. You aren't going to get control of it without God's help. If you're used to saying things you shouldn't, it's hard to stop. If you're used to gossiping, hard to stop. If you're used to flying off the handle at somebody that flies off the handle at you, hard to stop. Our tongue is a world of iniquity and is set on fire of hell, James 3, 6 says. Pretty strong language. So we've got to get control of our tongue. It's also e easy to have somebody irritate you and let them have it. It's easy to hear some big juicy gossip about somebody. And boy, you don't like that person already. So you pass it on to someone else so that absolutely everybody will think bad about them. Doesn't that happen a lot right now with our president? <laughs> people are spreading a lot of kinds of things. Some of it may be true, but boy, some people like to find dirt on him all the time. Now, whether you agree with the president or not, he's supposed to have our respect. Honor the king, the Bible says. We certainly ought to be doing that. But the tongue is something we have to get control of, too, of our, in our emotional life. Folk, I'm just giving you a few, few illustrations, but if we're going to exercise self-control, it takes control with our body, with our mind, and with our emotions. Now, personal evaluation tonight. Let's see just how you're doing. I keep quiet when I'm not supposed to talk. I raise my hand when I want to say something instead of blurting it out. Hmm. I'm daily practicing to do things to train my body to be more useful to the Lord. I keep my mind busy with the right kind of thoughts. I make sure my eyes do not look at sinful things on TV, the internet, or in pictures. I only allow my ears to listen to those things that would please the Lord. I control my tongue to be obedient to the Lord. I control my eating habits, eating enough but not overeating or constantly nibbing on candy and snacks all day. Now some people say, well, I just don't eat big meals, I just eat all day long. Could be. My doctor told me it might help my stomach if I'd eat all day long. <laughs> little bits, little bits. Don't eat big meals. Eat little bits. But I'm too much of a traditionalist. It's so hard for me not to have my breakfast at a certain time, my lunch at a certain time, my supper. Ask my wife. 
I am in such a habit of certain things and I just can't do it otherwise. So um, anyway, I need self-control, right? To eat six or seven times a day instead of three? Sounds strange to me. I get up from bed immediately when my alarm clock goes off. I make myself study something until I've really learned it. I make myself pay attention in church and not fall asleep or have my mind wander. Wonder in the future if the Lord's going to reveal that. How many people in church really went to sleep even with their eyes open? You know, there's some people who sleep with their eyes open. You can't tell they're asleep. But you just go over and push them and, oh, <laughs> even though their eyes are open. <laughs> Hope I'm not stepping on any toes there, but anyway. I keep my mouth from striking back with unkind words when someone irritates me. I obey those who have the rule over me without complaint or argument. Hmm. I don't give up on a job just because I get tired or am bored. Wish our young people would do that with homework. I allow nothing to stop me from my daily time of Bible reading and prayer. I keep my emotions under control. I don't get wrongfully angry, depressed, and discouraged or fearful of circumstances. I keep myself patient when I have to wait for someone or something. Some good questions for self-control. How did you do? The greatest room in the world is the room for improvement. And folk, if we're not where we ought to be, which none of us are, let's say, Lord, help me to make improvements. Self-control is certainly in the life of our Savior. It's a Christian character trait we need to exercise. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to study another Christian character trait, one that's so important in our lives day by day by day. Self-control is needed. And Lord, I'm thankful the Holy Spirit lives within to help us. If we'll ask for his help, if we'll be in your word, you'll teach us and show us what we ought to do. And with your help, we can do it. See our body, our thoughts, our emotions controlled to be what you want them to be. So Lord, tonight, use this in all of our lives. Bless us as we go from here. Again, may we certainly take time on Friday to thank the Lord Jesus for dying on the cross for us. And then may we look forward to celebrating his resurrection on this Lord's day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Appreciate your attention tonight. Shake hands with one another. Have a good end to your week. Lord